his modus operandi was intimidation. And when something would thoroughly disturb me, then I'd just let loose. I saw them both red in the face and Shula ready to kick Robbie's ass. Unanus and Shula. You're talking about two of the hardest-nosed people I've ever been around. Could <laughs> pound you with that football. What pound? You have to throw it every down the wind, and I would do it. Marino, gunning deep, touchdown! His goal was to do just what we did. Shula has won your Super Bowl. The best ever. Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Square jawed and supremely confident he was to the gridiron what a great combat general was to the battlefield. Beneath that masterly visage was an authentic blend of conviction, character, and intelligence. Over 33 years with Baltimore and Miami, Don Shula won more games than any head coach in NFL history. He did it with substance and style and two unspoken words that commanded, follow me. Shula has the greatest command presence of any coach I've ever known. You felt Shula was there. When he walked into our meeting room, everybody just hushed up. The presence was the jaw and his determination. He was into the game with uh, every bit of emotion that he had. He saw the red cash in that Oris was holding the ball, and the holding occurred before he put it. I wrote a whole story about the Shula stare. We don't really need missile defense. We need to just like have Don go out there, and if anybody shoots missiles at us, he can just go look at them. I've never seen anybody get so intense, so concentrated on an objective. He becomes possessed. The guy might have misplaced the ball, maybe somewhere like this. You placed the ball wrong. That ball was right there. You weren't looking where you were placing it. This is my life. <laughs> Did you see that? That's the way he was. Just loved football. Instead of a brain, he might have had little footballs running around there. In 1963, Giants owner Wellington Mara suggested that perhaps Don Shula did not have the disposition to succeed as a head coach in the NFL. A little scary with his temper. When I was dating, the guys did not want to come to my house to pick me up. They'd say, can you meet me at 7-Eleven? <laughs> it's almost like an approaching thunderstorm. You knew this deluge was coming, there'd be thunder and lightning, and you just have, had to get through it. I wear my feelings on my sleeve, and there's no camouflage. And I think in some ways that might have been intimidating. His modus operandi was intimidation. Whether it's you, the player, or you, the uh, opposing player, or you, the referee. He was a raving lunatic on the sidelines a lot of time. Super Bowl VII, we're playing the Washington Redskins. They took me off the field. I was seeing stars. And he's over me on the sideline just crazy. You got to get out there. We need you <laughs> on the kickoff. Just the voice, the eyes, the way he could snap back and could make you feel real small. And I'm not talking about just me. I'm talking about, you know, other NFL coaches, commissioners. There was a banquet one time, and <laughs> Robbie made a mistake of getting in Shula's face. And I reacted. I said, don't talk to me like that, or I'll knock you on your whatever. I saw them pretty much both red in the face, and uh, Shula ready to kick Robbie's ass. His first year of being head coach in Baltimore, and I said, you got to be careful about your temper. He understood, but he also knew that uh, he liked the players that weren't going to be intimidated by his temper, too. He almost felt like if you didn't stand up to him, he would maybe think less of you or certainly challenge you. My first game, my rookie year, Larry Little came up to me and he says, I'm going to give you this piece of advice. You better yell back at him because if not, he'll walk all over you the rest of your career. If Shula's volatility was not always appreciated, he was widely respected among players and the media for his clear, forthright manner. He'd let you know exactly what you needed to do to either stay with the team, get better with the team, or possibly get out of here. He's the most honest, straightforward guy and, uh, that there is. I mean, he's a guy that if he says something, that's what it is. Don Shula wouldn't lie. He has a fetish about fairness. The worst creep on the beat 
would get just as good a stuff as I got or anybody else got that liked Shua. He could get in your face, and you can get so mad you might want to hit that chin of his. But when it was over, he always forgot it. He would never hold a grudge. One of the things that he could do better than most coaches in the NFL is read his team and read his players. We had a fullback on our team, Jerry Hill. If you yelled at him, he'd crumble. And Shula would go up and say, listen, this is your kind of game. Watch how they're blitzing here. You can handle this. Some people need to be motivated in a way that they need to get their ass kicked, and some need to be pampered. And I think Shula knew the difference. Above all, however, Shula was a highly disciplined teacher who got the best out of his players. If we made a mistake in practice, Don Shula would stop right on the spot and have that mistake corrected. Every single mistake was talked over, why it was made, what we did, what the situation was, minute detail. I found him to be the most organized, the most repetitious individual you'll ever run into. And I think that's the key to success, is that he continually does the same thing and perfect it. We always went into a game feeling uh, we were uh, completely prepared on anything they could throw at us. I can't recall a time when someone came into a game and really threw something at us that really confused us. And if it did, he had some way to handle that. If you talk to him long enough, you realize that he just thought he was the best and that, that he had things figured out in a way that always gave his teams an edge. He was fourth and a footer and Shula sent in the punting unit. So John, the Unitas, motioned him off the field, and Don didn't go for that. When the Miami Dolphins had beaten the Houston Oilers, Bum Phillips, who was the coach of that team, was asked about Don Shula, and he said, he can take hisins and beat yorns. And when he beats yorns, okay, he can take yorns and beat hisins. He's one of those few half dozen men that regardless of the time and place and state of the team would have done very, very well. Attesting to Shula's consistency are his record 347 wins, six Super Bowl appearances, and in 1972, the only perfect season in NFL history. In 33 years as a head coach, Shula had just two losing campaigns. One reason for his enduring success, adaptability. The player in 1974, if you said run into that wall, button up his chin strap, he tried to run through that wall. Well, in 1984, you get a Mark Duper, Mark Clayton coming in here, you said run in that wall, and they'll look at it and say, well, why can't I run around that wall? So you have to adapt to that athlete. We had five young children, and it helped me realize that some of my younger players had to go through those same you know, trials and tribulations. So. That helped me understand the problems that young people had. He laughed and giggled with us. He would go out and have a beer with us. The thing that made him so good was that he was a player. He understood the player's problems. For all his dictatorial authoritarian style, he was playful. And, and it was an element of his leadership in that he had this ability to measure when there was a time for levity. Manny Fernandez, defensive tackle on the team, caught an alligator. Some of us had a bright idea to put it in Shula's shower because we knew that he'd go in and have his private shower. He came in and he said, all right, I want to know who put the alligator in my shower stall. And so like I said, well, the team voted as to whether or not we were going to tape the alligator's mouth or not. And you won by one vote and we taped it. He broke up after that and, and we loosened up the whole group. Zach and I had a lot of fun. Some of the weight trips may be too much fun, uh, according to Coach Shula. But, uh, um, you know, he allowed us that personality. Perfect example was the Marv Fleming earring. When Marv confronted the coach, he said, Coach, what do you see? And Coach looked at me and said, You're missing an earring. What difference did it make if Marv Fleming wore an earring? You know, it didn't affect what was going on in the field. Blessed with three outstanding quarterbacks with distinctly different styles, Johnny Unitas, Bob Greasy, and Dan Marino, Shula adapted his strategy to fit the man. Most coaches look to do just the opposite. They look to bring some guys in. I've got a plan. If those guys fit this plan, then we'll be successful. 
He's able to walk that fine line between not wavering when you shouldn't and realizing when change is taking place and you should. Unitas and Don Shula. Here you're talking about two of the hardest nosed people I've ever been around, and also two of the smartest people I've ever been around. John was not a high tempered, and nor was he loud. And uh, when Don lost his temper, he was both high tempered and loud. In 1963, their first year together, Unitas led the league in passing with a career best 3,481 yards, and over the next two seasons, achieved his highest passing ratings as the Colts went 22-5-1. Despite the success of their partnership, the fiercely independent field commander sometimes chafed when Shula tightened the reins. There were times he didn't agree with me in some of the things that I wanted to do, but, uh, you know, he lined up and played and competed. What John probably resented more than anything with Shula was the fact that Shula had a tendency to override John, and maybe even in some cases second-guessing. One of our first games, it was fourth and a footer, and Shula sent in the punting unit. So John, the Unitas, motioned him off the field, and Don didn't go for that. And he says, I'm the coach of this team. What I say goes. But he did not take the play calling away from Unitas. John Unitas continued to call his own plays. This is a classic case of a coach understanding uh, how to use his personnel. Shula won at Baltimore on the arm and savvy of Unitas. But when the coach moved to Miami in 1970, he adapted to the strengths of his new quarterback by devising an offense that used short, surgically precise passes to set up a devastating three-pronged running game of Larry Zonka, Jim Kick, and Mercury Morris. They had a great Hall of Fame quarterback, Bob Grazy. But uh, he wasn't a guy who could complete 30 passes a game. Bob was very uh, studious, very intelligent, took great notes, and uh, really knew what he had to do. Greasy called his own because that was his makeup. He wanted to be the field general. I would destroy him if I didn't let him do that. He provided me with the, uh, the tools and the car, and I was going to take care of this car. I knew the strengths and weaknesses of our operation. In the 1972 and 1973 seasons, Miami won back-to-back -back Super Bowls with a combined record of 32-2. and two. In the second championship victory, Greasy threw only seven passes. A decade later, when Shula hooked up with Marino, a quick-draw artist with laser accuracy, the coach knew how to deal with his rookie's gambling instincts. I give him a lot of credit for my early development as a, as a quarterback and being able to step in and, you know, basically start after my fourth game. The trust that you saw in Bob Greasy was the same for Dan Marino. The difference was that Danny relied a little bit more on Don doing the game than Greasy did. Coach Shula called all the plays, but he always trusted his quarterback. And, you know, if I felt I wanted to change the play, I was allowed to change of play. He gambled and he audible a lot, and he just let it let it fly. Pick a guy and let it fly. Marino throwing for Duper. I'm on the other side, and Duper's supposed to run a square in. Marino throws a bomb for a touchdown. I'm over there wondering, OK, well, did I make a mistake? Come back two series later, boom, another bomb to Duper for a touchdown. So finally, I asked Duper, I said, what's going on? You were supposed to run a corner route. You ran a, another streak. He said, well, Marino and I got this new thing. If he looks at me twice that side, that means go deep. So they start playing Sandlot. Now, what does Coach Shula do? Nothing. You don't want to mess with success. Shula maximized Marino's talents by designing one of the most effective passing offenses in NFL history. And in January of 1985, the Dolphins reached the Super Bowl. It was Shula's sixth big show move forward to when he breaks George Hallis' record. Dan Marino has gone down. Scott Mitchell has gone down. Steve DeBerg was brought in. He's hurt. He can't play. It's Doug Peterson, fourth guy on your depth chart, that comes in, is prepared enough, is ready enough to win a football game. Even the Philadelphia crowd giving a nice ovation to the winningest coach of all time. Of all the quality that uh, Don Shula had, you know, so many good ones. Adaptability and preparedness of everybody on a roster, I think, was numero uno. 
We had a, a, a tackle of about 260 pounds. They got in a little scrap in the locker room and, and down flat and we, we one punch. I had a great childhood. My dad came over from the old country. Uh, he was born in Hungary. Met my mom over here. And they were uh, just simple, hardworking people. Don Shula was born the fourth of seven children on January 4th, 1930 in Grand River, Ohio, a fishing village on Lake Erie. His father had aspirations of running his own floral nursery, but faced with supporting such a large family, Dan Shula looked offshore for his livelihood. When we were born, he had to get a higher paying job is when he went fishing, commercial fishing in Lake Erie. Don went to work with him every single morning and uh, the fish and the waves always made him sick and he always went out the very next morning with my dad he never stopped what i felt my father instilled in me was a uh, work ethic practicing hard and working hard and realizing that if you did that you would be rewarded what i remember growing up is just a very disciplined household and it was clockwork, everything was on schedule. My mom was in charge, she was the one that ran the household. She always would be making different decisions on how to do things, and she had more of a temper than my dad. She was competitive, she loved to play cards, pinochle, bingo games, and she'd come home and tell us, I won $500. The combination of neatness, rules, and a passion for winning fused in Don's personality. If we would be working on like a math column of problems, you know, he'd say, come on, let's see who can uh, finish first. And he'd stand there with his watch and time us. It was just always that competitive edge that permeated every aspect of his life. After a high school game, we got beat. He cried like a baby. He didn't think that he should ever be beaten. He and I would play hearts with my grandmother and grandfather. And if he wasn't winning, sometimes he'd get really upset. They found him underneath the porch crying over a card game. He cannot stand to lose. The perfectionism, I think, is just ingrained in his being. Braced by competitiveness and perfectionism, Shula competed in football, basketball, baseball, and track. I gravitated to football because of my love of contact, of uh, collision sports. You can't allow yourself to be pushed around. <laughs> Gotta be stand tough. <laughs> and you were tough. In 1947, Shula's toughness earned him a football scholarship to John Carroll University in a nearby Cleveland suburb. As an offensive and defensive back with the blue streak, Shula already was possessed with a take charge nature. When he was playing, we called him coach because he was always coming up with suggestions. Sometimes we'd get in the huddle if things didn't go right. He was. Uh, very boisterous, and if you didn't do your job, you heard about it. I just thought about doing it the right way, and I wasn't afraid of the consequences. And uh, sometimes, you know, they appreciated it, and other times they did. When you see his jaw jutting out, uh, you knew there was going to be hell to pay. We had a, a tackle of about 260 pounds. They got in a little scrap in the locker room, and Don flattened him with one punch. It was never premeditated. But it was just being so competitive that, uh, you know, when something would happen that thoroughly disturbed me, then I'd just let loose. After graduating from college, Shula was drafted by Cleveland in the ninth round. From 1951 to 57, he intercepted 21 passes as a defensive back for the Browns, Colts, and Redskins. I've never seen a player that come into the National League with the intensity that he had. Even though he didn't have the greatest ability, but he was so much smarter than anybody else. He was uh, always uh, telling me about receivers that he covered and things they did. I really was not prepared by my college background. Don Shula really helped me bridge that gap. I thought so much of Shula's ability that I wrote in the press guide that his future was no doubt already been determined that he's going to become an outstanding football coach. I made what I felt was the right decision. I've been second-guessed, and I second-guessed myself for not having put John in earlier. Having 
having played for Hall of Fame coaches Paul Brown and Weeb Eubank, Don Shula, after stints at Virginia and Kentucky as an assistant coach, excelled as defensive coordinator for the Lions. Only Vince Lombardi's Packers yielded fewer points than Shula's unit between 1960 and 62. When Colts owner Carol Rosenblum prepared to fire Eubank, he cast about for a replacement. Carol Rosenblum says, uh, I want your recommendation of who you think I should hire. And I didn't wait two seconds. I said, I'd take Don Shula in two minutes. He said, you're 33 years old. Do you feel that you're ready to be a head coach? And I said, without thinking a lot about it, I said, the only way that you're going to know is if you hire me. And he liked that answer, and he hired me. <laughs> I don't think anybody paid any attention to his age. All of us that were still there on the team knew him and had a lot of respect for him. When he first came in, he tried to be a little bit of a hard nose, which was expected, because he wanted to get that respect that was needed as a head coach in the NFL. And, uh, you know, he, he did. He did right away. I think everybody just sort of fell in line. In the 1968 season, Shula garnered his second Coach of the Year award as the Colts reached Super Bowl III. With Baltimore favored by 19 over the Jets, the big question was whether Shula would start the injured Johnny Unitas or league MVP Earl Morrill, who had led the Colts to a 13-1 regular season. I think a healthy Morrill was, was better than, than a damaged Unitas. Before that game, Shula went to him and said, look, Earl got us here, so I'm going to start him. But I want you to be ready if things don't go right. Then John said, I understand that. That's the second interception for him. And the Colts just made one mistake after another on offense, and it wasn't really all Earl's fault. We came up with a lot of mistakes that we had never made before. Freak plays that were happening out there that just went against us. I didn't see Jimmy Orr open in the end zone. I guess that was a big thing. Pass. Back to Morrow. All alone is Jimmy Orr. But they hit down the middle to Matty, intercepted. Right. It would have been a tie game at halftime then if I'd have seen him, because uh, he was open in the end zone, waving his hands frantically. When all of this stuff started to happen, hey, let's, let's get him out of there and, and put the real deal in. Trailing 7 0 at halftime, Shula considered his options. I was going to give John the opportunity to, to lead us in the second half, but uh, I wanted to give Earl one more shot. Morrill gives the ball to Maddie, and Maddie fumbles, and it's a New York recovery. As Shula and Unitas looked on, the Jets sandwiched two field goals around a Colts punt. With four minutes left in the third quarter and Baltimore trailing 13 0, the coach released number 19 into the game. And United gets a there wasn't a question mark whether Don should have put John in starting the second half, but you know he wasn't really Johnny U of old at that time because his arm was really bothering him. There's Unitas, and it is intercepted. Once we saw him try to throw the ball, we knew that hey, you know he's not the man that he, that he used to be. Less than he was, Unitas directed the Colts to their only scoring drive, but it was too little, too late. True to Joe Namath's word, Eubanks Jets had broken the NFL's hold on pro football supremacy, 16-7. The game is over. The New York Jets have upset the Baltimore Colts and beat them handily here today. I made what I felt was the right decision. I've been second-guessed, and I second-guessed myself for not having put John in earlier. It wouldn't have made any difference if they brought him in earlier. Shula was criticized for that, but I think the, the criticism was, uh, was unjustified. All I remember about that is, is later that night back at the hotel, you know, just my mom just grabbing us all and saying, leave your father alone, <laughs> you know, give him a lot of space. The loss killed him. He was through here as far as Rosenblum was concerned. There was a lot of pressure put on by Carol Rosenblum and uh, on Don Shula, and he didn't fulfill all of Carol Rosenblum's dreams. As we're sitting on the bus and we're going to Super Bowl VII, I'm sitting with Jake Scott, and he said, Coach, what are you worried about? That you're going to be the losingest coach in Super Bowl history? When the Colts finished 8-5-1 and in the season following their Super Bowl loss to the Jets, owner Carol Rosenblum, who had been critical of Don Shula's ability to win the big game, hired a new general manager, Don Klosterman. Although Klosterman was a friend of mine, 
You know, it was uh, taking away some of my control, and I didn't appreciate that. So Shula packed his bags and headed south in February of 1970 to run the Dolphins, who had won only 15 games in the four seasons of their existence. Don, it's sort of a great surprise to us uh, to see you uh, leave the Baltimore Colt organization and come down here with the Dolphins. It must have been a tremendous uh, opportunity for you. Can you tell well, us about it? It is a great opportunity, and I've wanted to become involved in ownership, and uh, this provided me that opportunity. Rosenblum had been overseas when this happened, so Shula had received permission to talk to the Dolphins from his son, Steve, the Colts president. Upon his return, Rosenblum filed a tampering complaint with the league, and the Dolphins had to give the Colts a first-round draft pick. We had only won three games the year before in 69, but there was an awful lot of talent on that team. I mean, there were, there were guys who were just chomping at the bit for discipline. The biggest difference in 1970 was the fact that every minute of every day was planned, and there was a purpose. We were there to be a team. This team had a segregated policy of rooming when we first came here. He integrated this football team. He roomed Paul Warfield and Bob Greasy together, which was a tremendously great thing to do to show that that part of it has no real relevance as far as a football team is concerned. In Shula's first year at the helm, the Dolphins made the playoffs with a 10 and 4 record. In his second season, they reached the Super Bowl, but were crushed by Dallas 24-3. When we came back, he made us watch ourselves get beat by the Cowboys. And it was a sickening feeling. So he turns off the projector, he says, now, you see how sick you feel? Well, just think of how sick and sore you're gonna be if you don't go back and redeem yourselves for what you did last year. His motivation, his intensity spurred him back that he wanted to be the best. There was no second. Shula's plan included a new offensive strategy. To utilize the speed and athleticism of his underused back, Mercury Morris, he designed a multifaceted ground game. Don found a way to make it work so that I could play, so that Jim could play, so that Larry could play, and we could all play together. That produced the greatest rushing team at that time in the history of the game. Everyone functioned in that running attack but it was a head coach who got all of us to understand that we could succeed at the highest level if we were willing to make those sacrifices. Paul Warfield, here's a guy that's probably one of the greatest receivers that ever played the game. We didn't have to throw the football, but Paul never complained. It wasn't individuals, it wasn't statistics, it was winning football games. That the Dolphins led the NFL in total offense was only half the story. Their high precision defense forced the most turnovers and allowed an average of 12 points per game, fewest in the league. That's Don Shula for you. He just put Mumford in there. They had a defense. They called it the no-name defense, but they played so well together. It's like no individual got the credit. The team got the credit. The defense got the credit. And, and I mean, that's, that's good coaching. His teams were so good on defense and so advanced on defense that if you ever got something, he never went back there because you know that it wasn't going to be there again. Our defense in, in 1972 made 13 mistakes totally the entire year as a defense. 13 mistakes. And that is how you win football games. After a 4-0 start, quarterback Bob Greasy suffered a broken leg and dislocated ankle in game five. But Shula had another weapon that was tried and true. Don Shula had the vision to secure Earl Morrill to bring him in to be a part of this plan for success for us. The beauty of having Earl there was the fact that he had been in uh, big games and the guys believed in him. Earl drops the throw. He sets. He is firing the near side. Pulley open. Touchdown! He pounds you with that football throw the pass where they had to. It was precision. He just cut you apart little by little. Here's the handoff to Mercury. Sweep for the right. Cuts back to his left. 15, 10, 5. He scores! Didn't matter how they lined up. We would line up and let them know, we're coming your way. Now, stop it. Joe Willie drops the throw. He fires. It is picked off. Miami became the first team to go 14-0 in the regular season. But even after beating Cleveland and Pittsburgh to win their second straight conference title, the Dolphins did not get their fair share of respect. Here we are, 
a team that's won 16 games in a row. Uh, in the Super Bowl for the second straight year, we were the underdogs. Every article you pick up was that Shula could win the big game. Shula had lost two Super Bowls. Shula did this, Shula did that. That really burned me because, you know, that's the last thing that you want said about you is that you can't win the big game when you're coaching. As we're sitting on the bus and we're going to Super Bowl VII, I'm sitting with Jake Scott, and he's just picking on everybody. And Coach Shula turned and snapped at him. And I think Coach was a little bit tight. And Jake Kick came right back at him and said, Coach, what are you worried about? That you're going to be the losingest coach in Super Bowl history? I had to be the most pressure in my coaching career because I certainly didn't want to be 0 and 3 in Super Bowls. Easy to the corner to Philly, 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 touchdown! We weren't looking to go be the first team to go undefeated uh, in the league. We wanted to win a Super Bowl. Going through Asanka, the 40, 30, just building one man out of the way. This goal was to do just what we did. The best ever. And now he watches the clock tick away as Shula has won his Super Bowl. I just remember the joy in the locker room, seeing him crying, the relief that I know he felt um, to get that monkey off his back. This is a letter that says you don't win the big ones, <laughs> except for my Rosenblum. <laughs> Finally winning the Super Bowl in the perfect season, you know, that was something that took me off the hook. So that was a pretty important game in my career. 17 and 0 says it all. The 1973 Dolphins finished 12 and 2 and rolled like Patton's tanks through the playoffs, winning their second straight Super Bowl 24-7 over Minnesota. And with a resounding and overwhelming victory, the Miami Dolphins have made it two in a row. Shula, like Vince Lombardi before him, had the makings of a dynasty, but Free Enterprise intervened. In April of 1974, the New World Football League signed three pillars of Shula's mighty offense, Paul Warfield, Larry Zonka, and Jim Kick. They would play for Miami in 1974, then leave for Memphis. It really personified what he's all about, you know, control the things that you can control. He was determined that we were all going to come back together one more time to pull off something that was even more historic than the 17-0. Unfortunately, it didn't quite happen. Body throws. It is. We lost the playoff game out in Oakland. The ride from the airport that day after the loss was like nothing I've ever experienced in the sense that this specialness that uh, we had would never have it like that again. The season's all over, and this is uh, what you realize when it's over and done with. And, uh, Oakland had what it took in the last couple of minutes of the ball game. And I hated to leave Shula. I hated to leave the Dolphins. But it was professional sports. It certainly hurt my feelings, and it, and it hurt my career. We could have been much better with uh, those three guys for the years that they missed. He won too fast. He won too early. After that, everybody expected the world. Shula continued to win eight division titles and two championships over the next 11 seasons. But by the late 1980s, critics began to question his ability to capture a Super Bowl with Dan Marino. Everybody got caught up into the Dan Marino syndrome, I and mean, there really wasn't uh, the necessity to emphasize other areas of the game. On the defensive side of the ball, they were constantly trying to find their one or two or three or four stars, but it wasn't built on a foundation of depth. If you have to throw it every down to win, and that's, I would do it, and that's how I felt. I think that's how Coach Hula felt, too. He was our weapon, and we didn't have anything else, so we, you know, we just kept using that weapon as, as best we could. Offensive line, we thought we could run the ball, and we're also calling pass plays, you know. He understood it, but it still bothered you a little bit because it's like, you know, we could have got these three yards if we ran. He used what he had. In the end, that was part of his undoing. He put so much faith in Marino, and one passer cannot win a Super Bowl anymore. I was always looking for the running back that we needed in order to help our defense and to help Dan get the most out of his ability. You know, I failed in that regard. And, uh, you know, we just weren't able to, to get back into a Super Bowl and win a Super Bowl. 
they were tired of 10 and 6 and 9 and 7, perfectly respectable anywhere else, but 20 years without a championship, today's sports fan, it soured. My dad ruled the family, uh, the children, a lot like he handled the teammates, too. Rigid, he expected a lot. I remember growing up not hearing as much praise, but more recognition. Okay, you did something good, but here's how you could make it better. He's been very supportive. He loves his family, sometimes in ways that you don't really realize at first, but because uh, uh, he, he wants the best for all of us. In 1958, Don Shula married Dorothy Bartish, and they had five children over the next seven years. The two boys, David and Mike, were groomed by their father to become coaches. We saw a lot more of them um, because we were involved in football. We'd go out over the course of the summer. We'd spend training camps out there. We'd be his roommate. After games, we'd ride home together in a car, and I would read the uh, statistics, and that's one of the ways I learned how to read. It was easier for him to relate to the boys, but he always made an effort to get into whatever the girls were doing at the time. I um, would train for the presidential every year, and my worst event was the softball throw. He'd say, you throw like a girl. <laughs> so he would take me out like two months before and just start working with me. I'd like to think that I was a good father, but my job was so demanding. My wife, Dorothy, was just a wonderful woman and did a tremendous job of raising our, our children. She fiercely cared about her children and pretty much revolved her whole life around her five kids and being the supportive wife for my dad. As Shula's career took off, it was Dorothy who kept the fiery coach firmly grounded. I never saw anyone else affect Don Shula like Dorothy did. She'd walk right up and just walk right into the gates of hell there in his wrath, and he'd just soften right up and talk to her. Uh, they had something special. Here's this tough, demanding guy who uh, chews up every player and every referee in the league, but was very much dependent upon Dorothy. I saw them in an airport, and Don was exhausted, and Dorothy's walking, you know, through the airports, practically dragging him. And she was ill at that time. She was the type of woman who just wouldn't let the illness get the best of her. Dorothy Shula had breast cancer, and my wife had breast cancer. And we walked into the, the hospital to get treatments, and Mrs. Shula walked in, and she saw my wife and started crying. And she said, not you, not you. She felt bad for my wife when she was dying herself. Well, that was, you know, certainly had to be one of the toughest things of my lifetime. After the treatment, you would have hope, and then that hope would be diminished, and then you'd have hope again, and then it would be diminished until the, until the end. In 1991, after a six-year battle with breast cancer, Dorothy Shula succumbed. Uh, I saw him cry for, I think, only the second time in my life. He became much more sensitive and in tune with what was going on with, with us. He knew he had to be there more for us and um, helped us to deal with our own emotions when he was going through such a hard time himself. One of the family's biggest regrets is that Dorothy didn't live to see David and Don make history as the first father and son in major professional sports to coach against each other. It happened in October of 1994. Walking out and knowing the opposing coach was your son, that's very special. I knew where everyone in our family, who they were rooting for, and it wasn't my dad. That's five turnovers in the game now. I hope that he coached well and played well, but I hope that we won. Dave and his team hung tough. They're not going to win this game tonight, but they weren't embarrassed. We joke now about bragging rights, uh, and uh, you know that's something I'm going to have to deal with now till eternity. After losing by a point at San Diego in a 1994 AFC Divisional Playoff game, many fans felt 1995 would be the year for Shula and Marino to win their first Super Bowl together. With 19 former first-round draft choices, the Dolphins were long on talent, but short on what had always been a Shula trademark, discipline. There were players that I picked up with the hope that I could turn their career around, and uh, as it turns out, I didn't. 
they didn't learn to work hard under Shula. Uh, they were brought in from other places and he had a harder time controlling them. Shula expected them to conduct themselves like adults and uh, dedicated professionals. The times had changed. He adapted to that. And to be honest with you, I didn't like what I saw in the end. I didn't like seeing a coach that, where a player would make a mistake and he would come over and put his arm around him. It just wasn't what made him Don Shula. Something going on that's strange about this team. People yelling and screaming and barking. And this game is a, is a team game, and, and this guy, he knows it better than anyone else. It's, it's not a Don Shula type of demeanor. The biggest difference I saw was the sensitivity to criticism and how nasty the criticism was. And it stung, and, and he didn't understand it. Never, never has he spent a week like this one. The fans and the press here in South Florida have marinated and barbecued Shula. That was a tough year because I never objected to honest criticism. But when the criticism is mean and vindictive, that's hard to handle. Jimmy Johnson, you know, he had thrown some, he had thrown the chum in the water. He had, he had bloodied up the water a little bit. Obviously, he wanted this job down here. He planted stories before the season that he was already in negotiations with Wayne Huizenga. He went on air and said he thought the Dolphins were, you know, clearly the team to beat, which obviously put more and more pressure on Shula to succeed. Success did not come easily. The Dolphins gained a wild card berth with a 9-7 record. After an embarrassing 37-22 loss to the Bills, Shula insisted that he would be back to honor the final year of his contract. Three days later, he met with owner Wayne Huizenga. We weren't able to put the things together in order to get to the, the big game at the end of the year. And the fact that I, that I had tried un, unsuccessfully to do that for a number of years then uh, led me to make the decision that maybe somebody else could come in and, and do a better job. Heising is uh, tremendously competent in dealing with people. And I think he probably convinced Don that uh, it would be in his best interest to quit coaching. They were tired of 10 and 6 and 9 and 7, perfectly respectable anywhere else, but 20 years without a championship, today's sports fan, it soured. Six days later, Jimmy Johnson was named the Dolphins' new head coach. It was time for Shula to adapt, only this time it was to life without football. His second wife, Mary Ann, whom he had married in 1993, stepped in. When you're a workaholic for so many years and then all of a sudden it's over and you can only golf so much. And she's made his life after football uh, very nice and still very fun and stimulating. When I mentioned things like, well, we were in an art gallery last night and Don bought um, Impressionist painting, you know, people are so shocked. He has learned to, to, to relax as a grandfather and, and, and enjoy the accomplishments of his grandchildren. Fireball! Whoa! <laughs> Way to go! There are days where you wish you were back on the sideline, the big games. But I don't miss the long days and the endless nights and the, the constant pressure that, that I had for 33 years as a head coach in the NFL. And you know, I felt that uh, I've paid my dues. Larry Zonko once said, when it was all about football, Shula was the best. When it became all about money, he wasn't necessarily the best anymore. The way he went out, wasn't on players' shoulders after a championship. You know, they'd had several years where people wanted more. And uh, the memories of those years have, have evaporated, and everybody now remembers the perfect season, the Super Bowl wins, and that uh, legacy of his will always be lasting. I hope that I'm going to be remembered as, you know, the coach that, that won the most games, the perfect season, certainly, and then also for trying to do things the right way. What Don Shula gave the game is something that uh, very few people have even come close to giving it. I mean, he's given it dignity and class. Even after he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1997, Don Shula demonstrated publicly that his coaching days were not over when a young man approached him for an autograph. His wife, Mary Ann, was surprised to hear Shula turn him down until she noticed the obscenity written across the fan's t-shirt. Shula told the fan that he would gladly give him an autograph if he would go home and change. 
When the fan returned wearing a different shirt, Shula, good to his word, signed it. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.